Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. This is part three of our segment with Naomi Marakawa. Naomi is an associate professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. She has recently released her first book, The First Civil Right, How Liberals Build Prison America. N Naomi, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So Naomi, um, how do liberals build prison America? Liberals try to build better prisons. They try to have an administratively perfect police force. Instead of looking at group-based power and instead of looking at scale, they look at the procedure for each individual person. Right? The standard of justice for liberal law and order is that each individual can be processed through a criminal justice system that is rights-laden, clean, with minimal discretion, outcomes but damned. Right? So the philosophy of liberal law and order actually cannot contain the two most disturbing features of the American carceral state, which is our incredible scale and our incredible racial concentration. The liberal goal of administrative perfection cannot contain scale or group concentration, and it doesn't want to. It's interesting you call this liberal. Uh, why is it not also conservative? Because I, for me, it sounds like a merger of liberal and neoconservative mm -hmm. ideology and thinking in terms of incarceration, in terms of containing mm -hmm. the, uh, in this case, uh, what we've been talking about, the African-American population. I call it liberal because these are reforms that are going for um, things that are supposed to look democratic. So it's done through a language of making the criminal process full of rights. It's done through a language of having proper Miranda rights. It's done through a language of we need more civilian oversight. And it's done through a language of we need more transparency. Right? And what, what, are these, I'm not, like, what do these things have in common? These are just ways of saying we want to just look at all of the little mechanisms and make sure that it's all clean, right? that it's all rule bound. Right, and, and uh, one of the things that have happened is um, yeah, local police, and we talked about this in, in, in the last segment, um, local police might actually be receptive to some of the changes mm -hmm. that maybe the guidelines are referring to, mm -hmm. but the approach and the administrative uh, strategy here uh, to contain police profiling may not actually work until we start thinking differently about the problem. Yeah. And that is something that you have quite mastered here in your book. Let's talk about how we can start thinking differently. So I think we need to think about scale and racial concentration, right? And this goes back to the definition of racism that I gave earlier, which is racism is the production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. And once you are willing to look at the carceral state for what it is, that is something that is huge, violent, and targeted against people of color, once you look at it that way, you will see that the carceral state is the thing that is reproducing and exploiting racism. It is creating and reproducing and exploiting vulnerability to premature death. Our interventions have to be geared towards reducing premature death. Our values have to be oriented towards saying group differentiated vulnerability to premature death is unacceptable. Or, to put it more simply, black lives matter. We have to actually absorb the value that black lives matter. Right? And saying black lives matter is actually very different from saying police transparency matters or trust in the police matters. Right? Or even good evidence collection through body cams matters. And the reason those things are different is we've had all kinds of liberal reforms that have done things that adhere to due process, that do make prisons, you know, a little bit better at the margins, that cut costs, which is also a big thing. And it's possible to have perfect adherence with due process and cut co cost cutting and do all of that in a way that actually diminishes black lives. So er eroding the police state, um, wouldn't a large component of that and the trust building component of that be about demilitarizing, disarming the police? 
So disarming the police, yes. Demilitarizing the police is far too modest a goal, right? There is a lot that's been happening in the conversation of police militarization. And I think what's happening is that people are responding with outrage to certain kinds of spectacles that look new to them, right? That feel outrageous. And they are outrageous. But we actually have to go to the question of who's being killed and how. And we have to just remind ourselves that Michael Brown was not run over by a Humvee, right? And yeah. Sean Bell and Oscar Grant III and Amadou Diallo weren't killed with AR-15s. They were killed with standard issue police handguns. And if we're gonna take seriously the Black Lives Matter, then we have to talk about the handguns too. No, I mean, so I just came back from a conference in New York where, where there was about uh, 10 uh, people from Ferguson, uh, a number of people from uh, the Dream Defenders, which is an organization that got started mm -hmm. uh, as a result of the Trayvon Martin case in Florida. And, uh, and they're looking at examples of disarming the police. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at uh, places like London, where you know, in some communities, uh, police are still walking around with the baton. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not armed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know uh, that in the United States, it's almost impossible for people to even imagine that kind of a scenario. But it is a possibility. And until we put that out there in the public discourse and have this discussion, um, that possibility it will never r raise its head. Yeah, that's right. And even to reference it as something that which is something that is beyond imagination, is a way of saying, really, the only immediate solution to stop the massacre of black people is a laughable idea. Right? It's something that we can't begin to get our heads around. And another thing to acknowledge in this moment is that, you know, it is. Um, a predictable response that police departments will say they have to have their guns. It's equally predictable that a number are going to say they have to have their Humvees, they have to have their night vision gogg goggles, right? Um, Obama's review of militarization, which is basically police, the review came out December 1st, the review said police militarization is actually a pretty good idea. There are just a few things we need to do to improve it, right? And, and then the Obama administration recommended having a comprehensive database of the tools that go out, having some basic civilian review, and then having police departments report back. Okay, so what is that? Database, review, report. So that's proceduralizing police militarization. That's not checking police militarization. And we should recognize that a few years from now, it will be thought of as totally normal that we see these kinds of military grade weapons on the street, right? So yeah, in the 1960s, there were maybe some viable conversations about getting the handguns, right? And now it's thought of as laughable. And now there are some viable conversations about getting the Humvees, but in 20 years, it'll be laughable. So we've really got to stop. This is the conversation we have to have. It. I mean, I thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And I thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.